And I think our semi-intelligent ancestors were the guiding force, they were the guiding hand in, in human evolution. When choosing a mate, we still notice beauty. But what really counts is how someone thinks, feels, and acts. All of these are products of the brain. He's a sweet, gentle man. And he makes me laugh. Um, I don't think I tell him that, but because <laughs> there's times he doesn't make me laugh. But he has really nice qualities about him. He was funny. He's kind. He's generous. He has all the good qualities I think um, you want in a mate. Her sense of humor, her laugh. She always <laughs> seemed to be upbeat, always happy, and um, she's had a great personality. Well, she's a very attractive woman. I mean, that, that I'm not going to lie, that, that had a lot to do with it as well. You never spoke to me like this. I tell you, there comes one moment once, and heaven help those who pass that moment by, when beauty stands looking into the soul with grace. In the classic tale of Cyrano de Bergerac, his eloquent words convince the beautiful Roxanne there's more to him than his extraordinary nose. It's brains, not beauty, that win her heart. Power of loving. Your name is like a golden bell hung in my heart. And when I think of you, I tremble. And the bell swings and rings. Everybody who falls in love knows that they're falling in love not just with somebody's physical features, but their personality, their intelligence, their creativity, their wit, and their charm. Yes. That is love. Yes. That is love. There are all sorts of things that mess up brains, and paradoxically, for that reason, brains make really good indicators of how fit you are during courtship. In fact, they're probably better indicators of that even than, than a peacock's tail is, of how fit a peacock is. Jeffrey Miller's idea about sexual selection moving us down the path of larger brains is really interesting because it's not the same old saw of tool use, language, culture. It's something entirely different. Now, I have some questions about how, what's the female role in this? How do women fit in to this process? But still, it's a very intriguing idea, and he might just be right. Miller is just getting started when he argues that the size of our brains can be attributed to our ancestors' sexual choices. He's also convinced that artistic expression, no matter how sublime, has its roots in our desire to impress the opposite sex. And that includes music, art, the poetic and storytelling uses of language, even a good sense of humor. According to Miller, they all stem from our instincts for sexual display. I think when a lot of people produce cultural displays, what they're doing in a sense is exercising these, these sexual instincts for impressing the opposite sex. They're not doing it consciously. But what they're doing is investing their products with an awful lot of information about themselves. A lot of people are very upset about this idea that cultural displays are there to attract sexual partners, they find this somehow demeaning, as if sex is dirty and culture is clean and the two must be kept separate. I think this is a basic mistake. I think the capacity for artistic creativity is there because our ancestors valued it when they were making their sexual choices. Miller knows his ideas about art, culture and the human brain are controversial. He's also convinced that as experimental techniques improve, it'll be possible to determine whether he's right or wrong. Sex is at the heart of evolution. The process of mixing and passing on genes produces variation that helps species meet the challenge of life in a competitive world. Sexually selected variations are those that help individuals find mates and successfully raise young. That's how, for humans, sex became fun and parenting rewarding. Those of our ancestors who took pleasure from sex and satisfaction from parenting had more surviving offspring than those who didn't. That was true generation after generation. These traits are now almost universal. 
Even if we choose not to have children, we still enjoy sex. And even when we adopt a child who doesn't carry our genes, we can still find parenting rewarding. The infertility specialist said, let's try a different option. And so that's what we did. She's my baby. The fact that Sharon didn't bear her or, or I didn't father her father, and that's the physical thing. Parenthood is so much more than the physical. The physical is the easy part. Tell mommy I want a satellite dish. <laughs> yeah. Tell her that's what you want, because that's the only way I'm going to get it if you tell her. Humans me. are the only species in which adults will care for children who are not biologically related to them over the long term. With our highly intellectualized brain, we have taken this compelling biological urge to mate and reproduce and care for children and translated that onto children with whom we share no genes in common. I tease Sharon, she's the new woman in my life. <laughs> I've never thought I'd fall in love with another woman, but she's, she's the new woman in my life and I wouldn't have it any other way. Humans are unique. We are a product of evolution, but we've taken the first tentative steps towards controlling our evolutionary destiny. It's a brave new world we're entering. Only time will tell if we'll be as successful at guiding our future as evolution has been. This is the first manifestation of human imagination. This is something really new on the horizon. It's expressing social relationships. Next time on Evolution. Visit www.pbs.org. The seven-part Evolution box set and the companion book are available from WGBH Boston Video. To place an order, please call 1-800-255-9424.